Hello and welcome to the NBS Show Discussion Podcast. I'm your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. Well, back in my day, we didn't have a season two. We had the show. It was going to end in season one. Well, and also joining us is a Fireheart Song. Generation Nexers suck. I don't know. <laughs> Millennial comment. Me. Your crap I don't know. Well, now, um, you guys' intros didn't really reflect what we're going to talk about today. Uh, but... Charity, back in my day, we had a Faust. It's called a Faustian bargain. <laughs> uh, that didn't turn out too well. It depends on who got to see Helena Troy. Eh? Eh? Well, back in my day, we had N64, so yeah. <laughs> back in that 64 graphics, and a Nintendo. You know what we <laughs> called it? The Nintendo. Me. Uh, <laughs> oh wow. Anywho, uh welcome to the discussion podcast and well before I head out right out of the gate, um this episode is a Patreon sponsored discussion. All thanks to myself lag. And he wants us to talk about the evolution of uh, my little pony, Friendship is Magic, the show since Lauren Faust left. Oh, you want us to talk about evolution after the creator left? How metaphysical of you. I know. Season three sucked, but it picked up after season four. <laughs> the end. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that, that's... Just, just shotgun blasting it all the way there. Uh, that's, that's a huge dismiss, dis, dismissal. I mean, there's a lot of good things that came out of season three. Nothing good came from season three. Technically, I came out of season three. Mm-hmm. Pat, Pat. Don't tell me you're one of those fans who say season 3 was a mistake. Well, it wasn't a complete mistake because season 4 happened. <laughs> uh, but anywho... Imagine my perspective as person who just finished binge-watching season 2 and season 3 was about to come out next month after nobody thought it was coming back. Mm-hmm. Season 3 premiere later... You're a bit disappointed. Okay. And that's it. And and you try to watch the show anyway because you're an excitable fan. And the more bad episodes keep rolling around, the more, like, help. Oh, God. Help. The bitterness Wait. is strong. With although, this. although I, I will say this. I'm not one of those fans who thought that Alicorn Twilight was a mistake. I was squeeing with joy because I thought it was... Well, not the best thing ever, but still, mm. it, it was a good thing that happened. You know what? Um, I think this is going to be an interesting show of perspective of views since Seppi came in late to the game while um, I, for one, started around the middle of season one. Silver, did you come in at mid of or the start of season two or mid of season two? Start of season two. I caught up just as Luna Eclipse was hitting the scene. Ah, all right. Wow, we are all over the place with this one. This is good. So, anywho, let's start off with the obvious, which is Lauren Faust. Story goes is that she went to Hasbro asking them if they could help her with her project, which is the Galaxy... Um, Galaxy Girls? The, yeah, Galaxy Girls. No, nah, it's um, Milky it Way... It was Galaxy Girls. Milky Way. Yeah, Milky Way and the Galaxy Girls. Yes, uh, that's the full title. So that's what she wanted them to look at because this is one of her pet projects. And, well, Hasbro did look at it. And, well, they say they'll think about it. But one of the head honchos there said to Lauren, do you think you can work your magic with this? And Lauren said, you know what? Why not? I love ponies. And she started creating the universe as it is um, creating the whole thing from start to end like every characteristics and whatnot and creating the characters from scratch and fun fact if you take a look see at applejack she is the only character's name to have a copyright thing like i think it's the circle with the c yeah a copyright mark yeah she's the only character with that while others have trademarks but I, I will challenge the idea that, that Lauren Faust created all these characters from scratch. As I understand it, she based them off of previous My Little Points that they, that they enjoyed. Mm-hmm. They just updated it. That's yeah. true. I mean, she has to take inspiration from somewhere. And Hasbro wanted her to work her magic with it. 
And well, the seeds were there. The building blocks were there. Now it's her turn to just make something of it. And should we go down the line? Because I think everybody knows this story already, right? Yeah. I feel like we've we've reached a good point. We know. But then the corporations took over. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, kind of, mostly. But Lauren's idea for the show was to create a show where parents could enjoy watching the show with their kids. It's not one of those shows where, oh my god, somebody please kill me. Mm-hmm. Air my god. <laughs> Like, oh my god. And she went out of the gate with, okay, let's create a world that's interesting and fascinating, yet kid-friendly. And the whole thing went from, okay, let's throw away the human aspect of it. Let's throw away the um, two funny, two ridiculous things that happened in season 3 and season 3.5. Let's throw those away. And let's build this world where it's believable in its own universe. There's going to be mythical creatures. There's going to be a technological advancement, but not that much because it's still kind of a fantasy world and so on. And anything that's in our world considered normal is strange to them. For example, which is the weather. And as time goes on, uh, we get more episodes that are kind of slice of life, adventure, and so on. I might I think her writing credit goes from uh, episode 1, 2, and 3. And the rest of it were done by the um, standard writers like Amy Kenny Rogers, Cindy Morrow, um, Megan McCartney, Amy Larson, and so on. Was she involved in um, setting up the universe for all of them? Or all of the 26 episodes of season 1? Mm, I believe so. I believe she was... She was at least manning the helm. If anything, Hasbro had to intervene and get her to lighten up on some of it. She envisioned a much darker world at times. Case in point, the Everfree Forest was always going to be trying to encroach upon Ponyville and required a constant guard. But that seems to be, well, one of the few things that Lauren tried to push, which is kind of tell a more adventure type story, was it? Yep. She wanted more adventure type stories. They pushed for slice of life. Mm. And I think a nice balance of both is perfect for the show. Having too much adventure can kind of muddle the whole series. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, as time goes on, we get all of the 26 episodes. We get the awesome songs. We get the awesome sonic rain booms. We got the um, infatuation of spike over rarity. And we, we get a lot of things as time goes on. And when the season ends, uh, we get The Best Night Ever, which is a really good episode. For an end of a new show, if it were to end there, everybody was happy and it was pretty good. That's not how I remember fans describing it. Really? I kind of enjoyed the one. Most people I heard were very disappointed by Best Night Ever. Really? No. It was the first... It was the first time fans had to express the bitter, it didn't live up to the hype. I hyped it so much. Really? No. All the, all the hypity hypedness. <laughs> that's interesting. Hypity hop hop, hypity hop hop. <laughs> oh, well, that, that's really interesting because as for me, um, when I first got into the ponies, I started around the episode, uh, which one was that? Uh, remember the CMC going um, all Metallica or Kiss? Call of the Cutie, if I'm not mistaken. No, it was uh, Showstoppers? Showstoppers, yeah, yeah, thank that you. was it. So that pulled me in because of that insane song that they did. Who would have thought? But anywho, um, that's where I came in and I followed up by backlogging every episode till then. And to me... I was not expecting them going for the best night ever because, well, it was set up, but I wasn't expecting anything great about it. But I, I think what got me was how Fluttershy acted. <laughs> Silver might say that that was kind of the downfall for Fluttershy. It was the downfall of writing for her, but uh, we'll we'll deal with that as we move forward. Mm-hmm. But mm. to me, I enjoy, and that season ender was fun. 
well, people disagree, oh. but that's opinion based. And as we go on to season two, um, we start hearing some, what's the word? Disagreement between Lauren and Hasbro, where they didn't see eye to eye on stuff. And I think by around this time, a few rumors came out that she's not working on the show anymore. I didn't get involved in time to really be a part of this drama. It's probably the only brony drama I managed to avoid. I only know that she spearheaded uh, The Return of Harmony, which was originally set up to be the season finale, season one, but they transferred it over. And I will say that as a se- it would have been an excellent season finale. If it had been a series finale, it would have been an excellent way to end it. But either way, there were creative differences, and Lauren decided to withdraw from the show. And, of course, people assume that was the end of the fandom. Because for some, for people who are really excited uh, to enjoy the show and, and these characters, we're strangely obsessed with getting it over with. <laughs> mm. That's something I don't know. Anyway, uh, we're in season two. Silva, why don't you take over for this one? Well, I don't pay as much attention to the background stuff. But, basically, Lauren departed from the show. M.A. Larson took the helm. They had an established set of writers. And in my eyes, season two is when the show really found its stride. It found that balance between character is a characterization, comedic setup, some adventures, but not maybe as many as Lauren Faust originally intended. This was the season where they basically said it was okay to have episodes without Twilight. Twilight had been our introduction to this world. She'd been our guide. As she discovered, so too did we. Now she was getting the hang of things. And so... They expanded it so that any pony could write uh, morals to Celestia. Dear Princess Celestia. I do miss those words. <laughs> oh, Dear yeah. Princess Celestia, I'd like to share my thoughts with you. Ahem. I didn't learn anything. <laughs> ah, best letter ever. That may be the best one. Golden Fox would disagree, but yes. Oh, by the it, way, it fun fact. That was the first episode to get leaked. Ugh, and boy, has that become a tradition. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sadly. But, anywho, things continued onward, but there was also a stronger corporate mandate. The Friendship Express got redesigned to look more toyetic. Uh, there was a greater emphasis on putting toy vehicles and places in the show, leading up to what I think is not as divisive a season finale, but it still draws some polar opinions, a Canterlot wedding. Mm, and I think this is the reason why Lauren kind of fell out with Hasbro because she didn't want this. She, in her MLP Bible, mentioned that there could only be two alicorns, which is Celestia and Luna. And her master plan for Twilight is was to uh, get Twilight to ascend or get Twilight to take over Celestia's job. Well, there's never been a truly straight answer. People love to quote the will of Faust. But basically, she'd started uh, planning a Cantalot wedding. And Princess Cadence was going to be a unicorn, which would have made a lot more sense in my eyes. Mm -hmm. But once she left, Hasbro started to tinker and said, no, we can sell more alicorn toys. We can basically repaint the Celestia model back to pink if we just change a few elements. Ergo, easier to make a big toy for her wedding day. It would continue from there. Season finales really took on a, you know, more of a buy our toys sort of thing. Yeah. Buy new Alicorn Twilight. Buy new, uh, well, buy lots of things. Yep, and the fact of the matter is, the whole show was to sell toys. That's the thing. Um, My Little Pony... Even Transformers, even the Ninja Turtles, are there to sell toys to kids. Um, there's this uh, FCC thing in the States where you are not allowed to advertise for your toy during your show's commercial. Uh, for example, you are not allowed to show pony-related toys during My Little Pony, and so on. Here's the thing. I don't really buy the, the oh, it's meant to sell toys crit- defense because I've seen good toy sales in shows. I was raised on them. But there are times where you just sort of roll your eyes and say, this was a one-time deal to sell a toy. It has no impact. I'm really not interested. 
Mm-hmm. And I will be honest, uh, when I watched a Candlelight Wedding, this was before I'd really go head, head first into the Brony fandom. I watched, I thought, you know, this is a show intended to sell toys. Maybe I've invested too much energy. Maybe I should just call it good here. <laughs> Uh, because I looked at Kane's and Shining Armor, and within that episode, they were, they enjoyed very little characterization. They were basically IR toys. True that. I mean, uh, as time goes on, the way that they implemented the toys for the series has gotten better. Do you guys remember the hot air balloon? Hasbro wanted to sell oh, that. <laughs> you know what? Yes, they did. Since you want us to s- promote the balloon, it's going to be in the start of every episode. Take that, Hasbro. <laughs> well, they made it a part of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, even Canes and Shining, have big time and repeated appearances are giving them a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit more. And that's the th- maybe that's the biggest thing of the evolution. We've been through a lot of big changes. Alicorn Twilight, the, her castle... Rarity and Rainbow have have moved up in their careers. Time helps us grow accustomed to them, but every change is met with a flurry of fandom argument and backlash. Especially flurry heart. <laughs> well, even even that enjoyed a little bit. I say that as if she's not a it's not a she. Uh, <laughs> but even flurry heart hasn't enjoyed a little bit better development with more recent episodes. Mm. And at the same time, too, right? Um, one of my favorite. Um, toy insert for the show was um, actually two. It's one is the pony helicopter thingy that appeared in uh, test, uh, testing testing one two three, and the others was the um, Pinkie Pie Swan boat thing from uh, Mod in Manhattan. What was that? I forgot that episode. But still, that was gift to the mod. Yeah, gift of the mod. That was a one off thing that didn't really matter. But hey. Uh, you want us to insert? Okay, here he is. <laughs> He's in the background. <laughs> what do you think? We helped you. We did your sales. But you can't take our story. Yep. <laughs> but if, if we're really talking about evolution, I feel like we should break it down to the characters. Mm, true that. Well, before we carry on, um, Seppi, got anything to add on? Since we are already touching on Season 3 and you came to Season 3 from the very beginning. I, I didn't know how I feel about season three. I felt like there was a bit of a quality drop or whatever when I first, like, entered the Crystal Empire, or at least I didn't know what to think. It felt different, although I noticed that, you know, season three and season, you know, the previous seasons were a lot different compared to, like, season one and season two, because season one and season two, they both had the same vibe to them like you know this is a fantasy show where magic is a thing and there's unicorns and all that but i don't know like season three it felt a lot different and i didn't know how i feel sometimes i still don't know how i feel about it did you know that this could be the last season for um friendship's magic it could have been i don't know (laughs) They were just trying to reach the syndication levels at that time. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's a 13 episode thing because if I did remember right, uh, Larson mentioned that they didn't even consider to continue on with a fourth season right until he finished the script. <laughs> and that's why there's a lot of rewrites from Megan. But that's here or there. Anywho, Silver, you mentioned about characteristics. Let's head on to that. Well, how some have grown, how some have changed. Let's let's start with Fluttershy because we, we kind of hinted at that. Yeah, true. I, I said Best Night Ever was the start of a problem for writing for Fluttershy. So many writers looked at that scene and just assumed that Fluttershy has two settings, Meek and Psycho. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So there are a lot of episodes where she just sort of jumps between the two. And while it can be funny, I'm not repeating that, I feel like it does her character a disservice. However, we have seen a lot of episodes where she's learned to become assertive, where she's taken the lead and really come into her own as someone who engages individuals in a one-on-one basis to improve them. And those are her strongest episodes. It's when she does a lot of effort and no one seems to change from it that you're like, well, that wasn't very good. Uh, the more recent Fluttershy leans in, for example, she didn't really affect a change in anyone, as opposed to Flutterbrother 
where she saved her brother from his uh, laissez-faire, directionless ways. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure with um, Fuzzy Chai because when we first start, like how how did Lauren influence Fuzzy Chai's character? I mean, um, she started out writing her as this um, shy, meek character, yet has that. Um, free spirit interest when it comes to things she liked. Um, that's shown in the first episode when she saw a baby dragon. And as time goes on, uh, we didn't really get a glimpse of her full characteristics until the best night ever. Well, it's true, but uh, I believe Lauren said that Fluttershy represented her in childhood or an element of her. All these characters, in a sense, are an aspect of the writer. Uh... Fluttershy was her timidity, her nervousness, her shy, awkward phase. But then you also, there's also, shy characters often possess a hidden strength for which we don't often credit them. Mm -hmm. It's always the quiet one. Exactly, but that's usually meant in a a positive way. (laughs) Yep. Indeed. But uh, I I do see what you mean by that, because as time goes on, we, we don't really see her evolve that much. And I think Lauren is still involved in season two in some shape or form. And we, we get to putting a hoof down where I think this is the first episode where we get to see a character, quote unquote, curse. A, a flying feather. Yes, Fluttershy has evolved to become the potty mouth of the <laughs> entire cast. Mm-hmm. And you got to learn that ponies need to have some feathering better curses. Gosh <laughs> darn it. But then... <laughs> Yeah, but still, uh, we could do see that um, they've tried to push Fluttershy out of her comfort zone. And in Hurricane Fluttershy, she was in the well, she was not really pushed, but she they they kind of made her to go the extra mile in helping. She's become more outgoing, more confident in reaching out to groups. The breezies were a big to do. Mm, yes, that that was a really. Um, huge uh, leap for her in terms of her character uh, shift. But I, I think it's before that too, because in Keep Calm and Flutter On, that was the episode where, okay, the main five, including Celestia, did not trust Discord. It came down to this meek pony who is very naive yet kind-hearted to reform Discord. It's not Twilight, it's not Celestia, it's not even... Applejack, it's sort of shy. But it was also time and returned efforts, because on its own, Keep Calm and Flutter On felt very hasty that Discord would just abandon his ways. It was good to see, it was good to see him stumble and get things wrong or, or regress back to his old self at times. And Fluttershy would be there to firmly but lovingly get him back on track. And I just inspired the Flutter Court shippers. Yes. But still. <laughs> But but, I don't know. but still, um, from this point on, we get to see oh, Fluttershy is you know pushover. She she gets to control Discord and so on. But in season four, we we see a relapse. A yeah. relapse for Discord? No, or for in Fluttershy. Fluttershy, like she's not as well um, motivated, or she's still a pushover. Uh, well, let's see here. The Tradia, yeah, Tradia was a bit of a. She's like, come on, Fluttershy, you could be more. You could do more. Mm-hmm. Well, she did kind of hold her ground in bats. Well, she tried to, but she had the entire team offering peer pressure. Yeah, peer pressure is not fun. I went to high school during this period, so yeah, I I know, I I know peer pressure. <laughs> but still, um, after trade, yeah, we go to season five, and I think this is the season where we get to see a lot of ev- evolution for Fluttershy, right? The biggest thing for Fluttershy was thanks for the memories in my eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was mean, but in the way... Oh, uh, she was she was firm. Mm. There's a difference between being mean and firm, Norman. Yeah, but you made me the, the more just cry. <laughs> oh, you want to talk about crying? We, we can always go back to talk about the Samurai Jack finale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anywho... Why did you have to bring it up? <laughs> uh, yes, 
when I look over this, I, I actually realize there aren't a lot of standalone Fluttershies. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's her role in Tanks for the Memories is her at her firmest. And then Scare Master is where she truly uh, asserts that she can do things independent of the group. But by and large, she's sort of just going along with the flow. I, I noticed that um, Fluttershy is one of those characters that had a lot of up and down in her evolution. Um, after Faust left, she was... Well, I don't know how to say this because it's not a really fair comparison to what Lauren had to what we are presented now. Right now, the crew or the voice actors have their characters down to a T, so it comes natural to them by now. And also, we get to see writers who are new or who have been there from the very beginning um, write Fluttershy as she is now, instead of developing her um, quirks or her personalities. Well, there's also, I think this can be said for all the characters. It's, I think it's a mistake to just claim we know what Lauren Faust meant. She always, she mentioned in an interview, she had an idea for the destinies, but she didn't apparently write that down for everyone. Or in some ways they have achieved the destiny, but now we get to see life after that moment of destiny. Mm-hmm. Case in point, rainbow dash. Uh, so I think it's a mistake to hold the show to whatever we think Faust wanted to do. And in many ways, now this show is crafted as much by the voice actor and actresses takes on the characters, the various show writers. It started with Lauren Faust, but it has expanded to include a lot of other interpretations and visions. And when it comes to the writers, Lauren was involved from the very beginning. But as time goes on, the other writers, like, for example, um, Larson got whole of season two and craft stories or had a idea of how to push that universe um, in season three um, McCartney had season three and she shaped it into the way she wanted to and Larson and McCartney were heavily involved with Lauren from the very beginning but as time goes on in season four things switch hands and right now even in season seven uh, uh, I think who, give me a second, I need to see who is in charge of Seven. Joanna Lewis and, um, Christina Sanko. Uh, they were the first, um, writers for the beginning. I think the Jim Miller was asked. No, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, season seven. They're the main story writers. Really now? Yeah. Oh. It, it probably explains why there's been so much best friend episodes. <laughs> Yay. Uh, but see, Yay. this, this is how the show evolves from the very start to now. Um, Joanna Lewis and Christine Sonko were not involved from the very beginning. They didn't saw Lauren's vision. And now, and what we got here is, well, they made Celestial Advice, which is an episode where I Here, people really, really like it for their characterization of Celestia. Well, it could be said that with fresh fresh writers comes fresh perspective. A lot of things tend to get very fixed. Uh, Case in point, Applejack. She was the even keel, the hardest to write for, and so there's not a lot of experimentation with her character. In fact, out of all the characters from season one onward, she seems to be the one that's evolved the least. If I do remember right... Even in season two, she was not involved um, at all. Like, she didn't really do much. I I think the meme of um, best background character, Applejack, came out of season two. Which was very, it's very harsh. Very, very harsh. But that that's the thing. With, once the team becomes sort of set, their views become set, and so... I'm glad for new talent that might be willing to show the characters in different lights. It doesn't always work, mind you. The recent Honest Apple episode, I don't consider a strong showing for Applejack. But when you're willing to try new things, we've gotten episodes like uh, Simple Ways, which got to show a side of Applejack we never saw before, even if it was satirical. <laughs> Indeed. There's also another episode, if I do remember right. Uh, it involves... Apple check? Uh, I'm trying to remember. 
I remember Applejack's episodes are not that much, but I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but I think uh, one of the few uh, episodes that they tried to kind of push ca- uh, Applejack's characteristic around was okay. Uh, the last roundup, she was an honest pony who never lied, but she could skip on the bill. Yep, and the other one was she was always right from the very beginning. Super squeezy ciders. Super speedy, super cider. speedy, super speedy, squeezy six thousand. Yep, that uh, that episode there, that one showed Applejack. Okay, she know what she was doing, yet everybody didn't. But still, her way was the best, and so on. My way or the highway? Indeedy. She's on a highway to hell. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but anywho, uh, Applejack's characteristics didn't really evolve that much, but. I think the writers here are trying to push her character into, well, a more broader scope, have more out of her. But Silver and Sappy, as the season goes on, we are introduced to new worlds. So what do you think of the world that we have now? So I admit, like, I didn't like season three all that much, but... I like the way that Equestria has developed since, you know, season two. I Sometimes I wish that it went down the Lauren Faust route, like, you know, like it said, with, like, uh, the more darker themes, like back with the Upper Free Force, which, uh, Silver, I, I sort of imagine you made some joke about how Ever, Ever Free could suck it. <laughs> yeah, lost, yeah. It is lost Lauren Faust is like, I wanted it to be darker, god dang it! You mean edgier? So, yes, she she wanted it to be edgier, but it never happened. Anyways, I I like the way things turned out, like, by now. Like, like even though, you know, the castle is a bit gaudy and... I, I enjoyed it. Like, one of my favorite parts about season four is how the elements from the show have progressed like it it began as you know just a simple concept then then we got a rainbow key story arc that helped build the world up a bit more so i'm i like how things are going yeah and i forgot to mention something um starting from season 4 we're introduced to a new mechanic which is um themed or a story themed not like in previous episodes where um, nothing is foreshadowed or nothing is kind of being told to us uh, if that makes any sense well that there's we're hinted at something is coming on the horizon and it was that way in season three but we don't know quite what's coming and now the difference between three and four is that four spent more time developing the idea Whereas season three was, hey, we have a journal at the end of this two-parter. Final episode of the season. Hey, here's that journal thing we talked about. <laughs> oh, Twilight's and Alicorn now. Now get to arguing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But still, there were no setup to the whole thing. Um, but here in season four, um, the tree gave a box. What was this box? I don't know. Um, but still, what key? This thing, that thing, key, key, key. Oh, we got, uh, key, the key is for Twilight's new castle. Yay. What's in the box? Who gets the box? How much is the box of a <laughs> storage force? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. But still, boxes. But if we're talking about the world, technically we've never gone outside of Equestria. That's what I find fascinating. Everything from Yakyakistan to the Badlands, is all within the domain of Equestria. The big selling point for this upcoming movie is that our lead characters will go beyond Equestria's borders mm. into a more alien world. Wait, is Settle Arabia not part of Equestria? In truth, I'm not entirely sure. They are delegates from Settle Arabia. Must not ignore that. And by this, you mean you're talking about the map, right? Like whatever is presented in... The... Well, I I mean everything we've seen. We've seen uh, the Dragon Lord address the dragons as dragons of Equestria. They are in, still in Equestria. Oh. And, and so, one, I'm wondering just how far this world extends. But it seems like every place they've visited 
is in some way within the domain of Zia Questia, which I find rather interesting. Celestia and Luna's influence extends very far, but there was a period where it felt like the world was starting to actually diminish in my eyes. This was about the time of the season four finale where everyone was getting depowered and brought low to set things for the, for the main six. What Lauren Faust first presented to us was a band of six unlikely heroes. Now they're the six default heroes. And perhaps in that way, I was gr- glad when, when the writing staff introduced Starlight Glimmer and restored Trixie and created their own dysfunctional band. <laughs> It's one of those balancing points. Your character should live in the world. The character, the world should not exist just for your character. Because mm. if that's the case, you've, you're diminishing the world to make your character look good. And that is something from which many have struggled. There's a reason why Star Wars and Harry Potter, uh, Lord of the Rings, all of these can generate such fan interest. It's because there's a world of autonomous characters on their own quests that you can explore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, well, I, I think that's a secret to most entertainment or most shows because if the world that the main character is in can live without them there, that means it's a huge success. That said, it's not like I want to see the main six taken away from the show we enjoy, but I'm glad that with the influx of new writers comes a greater willingness to have other characters participate. I still kind of bemoan that Brayburn on his introductory episode disappeared from the conflict. It's the balancing act back then. Like you, they need to show the main characters more back then. Um, the show was more targeted to the target audience, which is girls above the age of six. See, I'd, I'd argue that 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 target has never wavered. It's just that the show is showing a bit more. Well, show is showing. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more respect towards the target audience than we usually expect. They're willing to show our lead characters being wrong or learning or getting help from a third party. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look-see at Over the Barrel, the general idea was there. And they here's the the thing. Brayburn and Little Brave Wolf, was it? Oh, Little Strongheart. Yes, Little Strongheart. Brayburn and Little... What you said? (laughs) Brayburn and Little Strongheart did the thing that I personally like, which is talk about your problems and solve it via conversation. But Applejack and Rainbow Dash. Here comes the thought. <laughs> but still, um, episode was okay. Uh, poor Polsky, he took a lot of, he got a lot of flack for this one. Well, admittedly, it was not. It was one of the weaker episodes of season one, most, mostly because it's a story where our main heroines would have actually enhanced the situation by their absence. They actually made it worse. Yep. Uh, but still, wait, was Twilight in this episode? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, they were all. They were all in that episode. Oh yeah. Yeah, this was back during season one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, of course she was in there. She was in every episode. But I didn't. Yeah, true, but I didn't really notice any, well, she, even though she was there, I don't see her doing anything. Uh, she tried to talk to ponies and they growled at her. Uh, yeah. Well, anywho, um, but that's right. Actually, Twilight is probably the one who's had the hardest time over this transition. Hmm. If we're talking, Twilight was, and Lauren Faust said this in interviews, she was, a counterbalance to how people thought of intelligent women. You had this image of a nerdy, big glasses, socially awkward. And Lauren Faust's experience had been that the really, uh, the really exemplary students at the school she'd attended had been very beautiful, very composed, very socially adjusted. And so she, Twilight was a way to combat that. She still has social quirks, but that's just the trait of a character. But since season two and onwards, it feels like she's lost a lot of what made her Twilight. But there hasn't been a lot of what's really come in to create the new Twilight. I feel like she's been less involved in the show over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do see that. Because if you compare it from season one, <laughs> like even Seppi says, she's involved in all 26 episodes. 
clearly, as time goes on, um, she's been uh, showing up less and less. And if you think about it from the story point of view, well, she's a princess, she's busy, so why bother her with her royal duties? Other characters have interest, uh, more interesting lives. That's what I can't get my mind around. You're telling me that being royalty and head of this is all boring? She should be facing much greater challenges at this point. True, but still, when it comes to writing or coming up with an idea with a story for a character, obviously what I'm saying here doesn't hold water, but still, either you can see Twilight do people work, or you can see Rainbow Dash doing a Sonic Rainbow with the Wonder Bolts. Yeah. Uh, she gets to see them be teased by the Wonder Bolts, poor girl. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, that's a debate we could devote an entire podcast to. How do you depict a princess's life? You know what? That's another story for another day. If our Patreon people would want to um, suggest us we do that, you know way to do it. But in all honesty, um, there's no fine way for us to discuss this without going all over the place. Because, um, what was it? The evolution of, yeah, the evolution of the show lore since Lauren Faust left. So, how is the lore now? Well, it's somewhat haphazard in my view. It's it's what works in the moment but may not work overall. You release the Journal of the Two Sisters and that talks about how they came to be. But now, Flurry Heart throws a wrench in that because people are now questioning, well, are there natural-born alicorns? There is sort of a struggle because this didn't have a seamless history woven at the start I think the development struggles. Yeah, even with the show Bible that was created by Lauren from the very beginning, that kind of seems to be thrown out the window. Way out the window. Mm -hmm. Here's the box where my brain came from. (laughs) To me, Lauren's things is kind of law, but it's kind of flexible, like tissue paper. (laughs) But still, um, everything is set. Like, they could have only been two Elicorn at the very beginning, but now we have five of them. And then you introduce some mythological creatures like changelings, minotaur, minotaur, dragons. Uh, and then you get the bunyip. And then you get the breezies. And then you get the puppy dog. And then you get the rest of the uh, mythological creatures. Mentacore one of them. And so on. So, how does... Like, to me, everything was set in stone until new people came into the fray and they needed to tell a good story. To I, I think that Lauren's thing is still there, but it's more of a guideline now than something that needs to be followed to the T. If I describe the show as a, as a structure, like a house, hmm. Lauren... Lauren Faust and Company laid a very solid foundation. Great characters, a magical world, a lot of opportunity. The new talent has added their own style to each one. And so the overall structure can appear a little bit haphazard, and yet it's a fascinating piece as a collective. It's not abandoned its foundation, but it's added new spins the higher up you go. And we haven't quite put a cap on this house yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see what you mean by that. It's, for example, if you play a fighting game like Street Fighter, um, every character has their move list, and from that point on, they evolve that list or improve certain things, and goes on and on and on to what we get now. And it's changed a lot. And change can be hard. Indeed. Not many people like it, but corporate seems to go with it. I, I only have one thing to say about it. Oh, go ahead. Ch- 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 changes face is strange. Ch- ch- changes. <laughs> you don't want to be a richer man. Oh, time boy. may change me, uh, yeah. but I can't change time. I'm impressed that you know that song. Usually there's a cultural, generational, mental gap. <laughs> Uh, I watch Shrek 2 a lot as a ah, kid. And there it goes. There's, there's <laughs> oh, boy. The, the bridge. Shrek is the bridge. Oh, boy. But anywho, but anywho. 
I'm going to try and touch upon this. Since Lawrence was involved, we got one prominent voice actor coming onto the show. Um, that is John Delancey involved. And I think that started off with a trend going from John to William Shatner to Weirel to even Dina Hall. So we're getting more celebrities coming onto the show. Even uh, who's that girl from the board game thing? Give me a second. I, Felicia Days. Ah. As time goes on, most celebrity keeps coming and coming and coming. And, well, they're hyped for the show as we are for them to be on. That's one of the few things that the show kind of brought along ever since, well, Lauren was involved. That's one of the evolutions that didn't change. Well, it's certainly been most welcome. And it's, and it's a testament to what she created that so many actors now both celebrate the show and want to participate in it. I can only imagine how the movie actors uh, feel about it. They probably think it's another job or something. Not everybody cares about ponies, although it's great to see that, um, you know, so many people have enjoyed the show over the years. Here's the thing. People will do it for a paycheck. People will do it because they love it. People will have different reactions. But the fact that it even is worth a paycheck or has caught this attention is a testament to how unexpected this was. Oh, yeah. Even us here. Like, come on. Um, without this show, the three of us wouldn't be talking in this. If my dad didn't thought I was watching that fateful day, I wouldn't be here. You know what? Uh, the internet got out when you said that word. So, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, but still. Um, Impressive timing. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but still, um, without the show, we all wouldn't be here. And... That's a testament to itself. Ah, so the times the, may change. Mm-hmm. So the, sh- the show grows, it develops, it changes. We question the changes. But it's always building upwards. That's the nice thing. I haven't, I haven't really felt that they're taking anything away from the show yet. Same here. Even as time goes on and how the show evolves after Lauren's uh, departure, I-, I think that it's gotten really, really interesting. I'm not 100% sure what Lauren could have brought to the table since, well, okay, um, from what we understand, she wants to make more adventure kind of story. And you know what? If she was involved now and having her take on adventure stories, could you just imagine what would happen with the episode like Princess Twilight Sparkle or even Twilight's Kingdom? Like Twilight's Kingdom was a Dragon Ball fest. Da, 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 da. Oh wait, that's old Dragon Ball. <laughs> yeah. Now you're all now you're all cha la. <laughs> but still, could you just imagine like her involvement with that? It's always interesting to dream about what might have been, but then again, there is no guarantee that's how it would have been. Oh, true that. But it's just fun to imagine. It's like death battle. The result doesn't matter. Superman versus Goku. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> uh, but uh, Silver's nightmares. Is there anything more... This is a hard topic to cover because the scope of it has grown so large. Mm -hmm. Characters have developed, some have achieved their destinies, and yet they've learned that there's there's life that happens after destiny. (laughs) Yeah. There's been expansions to Equestria. Not not always a winner in my eyes. One one thing I didn't get to say is that for all the new species we've, we've been introduced to, only Zakura from season one has ever had something to offer the ponies. Everyone else seems to benefit from the ponies, but doesn't give back. Oh, true. I don't know. I mean, to me, um, the dragons seem to be in that situation where we will offer something soon. How about we don't burn your town? Is that a good deal? It seems more like they're following the George R. R. Martin. Oh, the dragons are coming. The dragons <laughs> are going to do something soon. Really soon. Next season. Still soon. <laughs> really soon. Soon, soon, soon. <laughs> uh, but still, but still, we do get a lot of more interactions. And you know what? You Talking about Zakura, I think she needs more love. We don't get anything at all. Like, what? Well, stay tuned for later this season. Is there anything? Yeah, there's, well, I no spoilers. I can't spoil. Not not on the air. Oh, okay. There will, there will be things. Sakura things. Hmm? Things with Sakura. Yay, finally. But that comes later. Later. 
And I, I think we can go round and round and still go back to the point of what is Lauren's vision? Is Did anything change? I mean, there's a lot to cover and I think, yeah, I think this is a good point for us to kind of uh, put a pin on it. I'm sure uh, maybe in the future we'll kind of mention something or thoughts on it probably in some other review. But as for now, um, Silver, you got anything to add on? To say that this, how this has changed from Lauren's vision is to first assume we actually know her vision. And we only have snippets and tweets Ergo, I, I, I'd I rather look at this more as the show has continued to grow, it has incorporated styles, it has become more diverse, but maybe not always coherent in small ways, or maybe even big ways. And so it's interesting to compare and contrast how people try to present these characters. Yeah, I agree with that. And with how our leads, or the main six, are now from a very hopeful Rainbow Dash to join the Wonderballs to part of the Wonderballs getting embarrassed by her parents. Ha 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 ha. Oh boy. That's a review to talk. So yeah, our lead characters here have evolved from their very beginning. Oh, talking about evolution, have you seen uh, the CMCs? There was a screenshot of, I think, um, Season 2, uh, Sweetie Belle arguing with Rarity. I think that could have been in the sisterhood social. And yeah. their size comparison to now has jumped up in size. Like, they've grown up. They're oh. slowly growing. I mean, sometimes that may also... I, I know We Are Borg did an excellent comparison. Part of me wonders, is this just a simple scaling issue, though? <laughs> they, their body shapes haven't changed. Well, scaling not- is... A cheap way to say uh, highlight, control, and scale them. <laughs> uh, okay, then. Uh, Photoshop tricks for people. <laughs> or illustrate the tricks for people. Uh, what's it? Shift. I forgot. But still, uh, you could be right, Silver, that they just highlighted them and scaled their size to be bigger. But still, it's nice to imagine that they've grown up. <laughs> I don't, I don't mean to, to poo-poo on an excellent observation, but I want to point out perhaps a possibility. True, true. but let me dream. Their voices are growing up too. Yeah. You're mean, Silver. Knock, knock. Who's there? Mean. Mean who? Mean Silver. Hello. <laughs> Doesn't feel all that great now, <laughs> uh, But anywho, um, I, I think... We can put a pin on it here right now, unless Seppi wants to add anything on. Nah, I'm good. Alrighty then. And I have said my piece a lot. Like, there's so much to add on. It's be endless. So I'll just put my pin here. So anyway, um, next week, Silver, you got any ideas what you're going to do? Well, I believe we need to continue onwards and upwards with Season 7, as we talk about a flurry of emotions. Ah, yes. The episode where I knew where this was going... Because I have two nephews of the same age. Uh, oh dear. Joy. How are you st- how are you still alive, sir? Well it's a lot of bandages. <laughs> and Phoenix Downs. <laughs> hey. But that's next week's problem. <laughs> uh, but anywho uh, if you guys at home would like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash the MBS show. And if you, well, a dollar we got you a thank you and full access to everything we have on the Patreon page. Deleted episodes, um, future releases of episodes that will be released a day earlier. Usually it would be the uh, review or discussion podcast. And also if you want us to talk about a subject that you want us to talk about, for example, like this one here, or a review that you want us to do, um, that will be $5. One of the few things that I really want to do, if anybody wants to pay train support, is talk about Kung Pao, Enter the Fist. That's so really wee, cool. wee, wee. <laughs> I've been hinting this for this one. Uh, you know what? I don't care. I've got to find a date where we can do this one. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, you're in for a treat, Safi. The greatest, uh, the greatest Kung Fu movie in history. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Um, if you ignore um, all those other really um, good kung fu movies. Um, yep, yep. Um, um, I, um, Era 404. What am I supposed to be watching? That's it. We'll talk about that one later. So anyway, uh, if you guys want to do that, $5 to the Patreon, we'll get you that. Anyway, I would like to thank some people. And thanking up first is Lurker Cat, Twilight Genesis, Lem Dragotoria, Starstream, and myself, Like. Thank you guys for the support. And myself, Like, I do hope that you like our banter here because this is a really tough subject. At first, I thought it was easy, but oh no, it was tough. It was really, really tough. <sighs> but anywho, I have been Norman Sanzo. Hey, I'm the Silver Quill, and impacted by it that you made a Faustian bargain and ended in tears. And I've been the young and sapphire heart song. Young and yeah. sapphire. <laughs> uh, we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode of the Yes Show. See ya. Me. Bye. So since we're talking about evolution, right? How does Silver Quill evolve? Oh, actually, you guys, you guys should see this then. Oh God. <laughs> Where was it? Where was it? Oh, God. Where did I put this? What have I started? Look and behold it, the evolution of Silver Quill. Oh, God. What have I started? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this... Angry Quill! Yep, yep, yep. Uh... <laughs>